Hello viewers, I am Dr. Robiul. I work as a lecturer in pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is inflammation part 2. In this video we will discuss the cellular events of inflammation that will obviously include leukocyte recruitment, events in the lumen, migration of the leukocytes across the endothelium, migration in the tissue which is also known as chemotaxis. We will also discuss briefly about phagocytosis and I would also like to mention that I have a separate video entirely on phagocytosis so you can watch that video too after finishing this video and at the end of today's video we will also discuss briefly some introductory points about the mediators of inflammation okay so a lot of topics so let's begin so in our previous video about inflammation we had talked about the vascular events of inflammation that included vasodilation and also increased vascular permeability and we have also mentioned the different mechanisms involving those events so in this video we will begin our discussion of the cellular events of inflammation by starting with the topic leukocyte recruitment now what do we mean by leukocyte recruitment it is the journey of the leukocytes from the lumen of the blood vessel to the sites of inflammation and one thing you have to remember this journey of leukocyte recruitment occurs quickly following the vascular events the major leukocytes that are involved in this process of recruitment are phagocytic cells or phagocytes and they are mainly polymorphonuclear neutrophil or macrophages why because we had talked about the goals of inflammation in our previous video and there we had uh, mentioned that one of the goal was to get rid of the organisms or damaging agents that are causing cell injury and to do that these phagocytic cells need to be recruited in the site of injury or in the site of infection so that's why the major leukocytes that are involved in the process of recruitment are phagocytic leukocytes or phagocytes mainly PMN that is polymorphonuclear neutrophils and macrophages so the recruited leukocytes will go to the site of injury or to the site of infection and their job there is to clear up the injured tissue and destroy microorganisms and foreign bodies so in a sense it is a protective response however when inflammation is strongly activated many normal bystander host tissues can get damaged during those process so always remember that although leukocyte recruitment is a protective response of inflammation however if strongly activated it can damage normal bystander host tissues the next thing that we need to discuss is the different steps of leukocyte recruitment always remember leukocyte recruitment is a multi-step process and it has several phases some of the phases occur inside the lumen of the blood vessel they include margination rolling and adhesion phase then some phases occur when the leukocyte is migrating across the endothelium and across the vessel wall and the last phase of leukocyte recruitment occurs during the migration of the leukocyte in the tissue towards a chemical gradient and that type of migration is also known as chemotaxis so now let's talk about these different phases one by one so we will begin with 
the phases that occur inside the lumen of the blood vessel and the first one was margination. Now in order to understand margination, first we need to know axial blood flow. Now what do we mean by axial blood flow? Because margination will occur when this axial blood flow is disrupted. So in a normal circulation, when inflammation is absent, blood flows in axial manner. That is, it will have a central stream that will contain red blood cell and leukocytes and that central stream of blood flow will be surrounded by a peripheral cell-free layer that is mainly containing plasma. So during normal circulation blood will flow in an axial manner. There will be a central stream that will contain RBC and leukocyte. If I want to be more specific, RBC will be in the center of that central stream because it is smaller and it is flowing faster and uh, that will be surrounded by larger leukocytes and then there will be a peripheral layer that will contain only plasma and no cells. But what will happen during inflammation? As we have discussed in our previous video, during inflammation there will be stasis, blood flow will become slow and whenever the blood flow becomes slower, the central stream of the cells will widen. At the same time, the peripheral cell-free layer that contained plasma, that zone will become narrower due to loss of plasma during inflammation. So the combined effect of these two things, the widening of the central stream and the narrowing of the peripheral cell free layer, these two events will result in margination of the leukocytes. Leukocytes will accumulate at the periphery of the blood vessel. So this is known as margination. So here is an image showing margination. On the top image you can see the normal blood vessel where blood is flowing in an axial manner. So there we can see the axial blood flow. Notice that the red blood cell is in the center of the axial blood flow and they are surrounded by leukocytes and also notice that the peripheral plasma layer is cell free. So that was during normal axial blood flow. But now look at the bottom image. What has happened here? Due to inflammation, the axial blood flow has been disrupted and you can see that the leukocytes are now accumulating at a more peripheral position in the blood vessel. So this is margination. So now that we have talked about the first phase that happens inside the lumen, now we will move on and talk about the second phase that happens inside the lumen and that was rolling. Now why does rolling occur? Now rolling occurs due to the initial transient loose attachment and detachment of the leukocyte with the endothelial cells. And since the leukocyte binds and then detaches and then binds again with the endothelial cell loosely, so the leukocyte appear to roll over or tumble. This is known as the rolling phase of inflammation. So what is the mechanism of rolling phase? First, locally produced cytokines and other mediators will activate endothelial cells. The activated endothelial cells will express adhesion molecules on their surface and those adhesion molecules will result in loose attachment of the leukocyte with the endothelial cell. Due to the loose attachment, the leukocyte will bind, then detach, and then bind again and will act in a tumbling manner and that will result in rolling. 
So now let's go deeper into the mechanism of rolling and let's see which cytokines are involved and which adhesion molecules are involved in the process of rolling. So rolling is mediated by a family of proteins called selectins. Always remember there are three types of selectins. They are E-selectin that is present on the surface of you guessed it, endothelium. Remember E for endothelium. The other selectin is P-selectin. So you can remember that it is found in platelet, but also remember that P-selectin is found not only in the platelets, but also on the surface of endothelium as well. And the last type of selectin is L-selectin. And you guessed it right, it is seen in the surface of leukocyte. Always remember L for leukocyte and so the selectin present on the surface of the leukocyte is obviously L-selectin. Now I have already mentioned that the expression of these adhesion molecules on the surface of the different cells are regulated by different types of cytokine. So let's now elaborate that part. So always remember, tissue macrophages, mast cells and endothelial cells can release a lot of cytokines or chemokines when they encounter microorganism or dead tissue. So the main cytokine involved here is tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-1. They will be released from the tissue macrophages, mast cells and endothelial cells after they have encountered a microorganism or the tissue and that will act on the endothelial cell and in your textbook you will see the endothelial cells of the post capillary venules are particularly affected so the Cytokines like tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-1 will act on the endothelial cells of the post-capillary venules that were close to the site of infection and that will result in a well-coordinated expression of a lot of adhesion molecules on the surface of the endothelial cell. And usually it takes about one or two hours one to two hours for the endothelial cells to begin expression of the adhesion molecule E-selectin on their surface. Now one important point that I would like to mention is regarding P-selectin because the examiners are very fond of this question. Now always remember P-selectin is not expressed that much on the surface of endothelial cell or platelet under normal condition. Instead, it is stored intracellularly inside cell granules which are called Weibel Pallady bodies. And uh, certain mediators like histamine and thrombin can activate the endothelial cell and cause redistribution of P-selectin from Weibel Pallady bodies to the surface of the cells and that will later play a role in rolling. So here is a table summarizing the adhesion molecules that are responsible for the rolling phase. So on the left you can see the adhesion molecules that are seen on the endothelial cell surface and on the right you can see the adhesion molecules that are seen on the surface of leukocyte. So endothelial cells will contain P-selectin, E-selectin on their surface and P-selectin, E-selectin will have their counterpart or ligand on the leukocyte and they are known as Salil lewis modified protein. Okay? And also you can see that leukocyte also has a selectin and that is L-selectin and the counterpart of that L-selectin or the ligand of that L-selectin is obviously on the surface of the endothelial cell and that is CD34. So now I am showing you an image 
depicting the different steps of leukocyte recruitment and we will come back to this image over and over again during today's discussion as we move on discussing different phases of the leukocyte recruitment. So during the rolling phase what happens we have just mentioned that um, the adhesion molecules particularly selectin will be expressed so you can see on the bottom part of the image a macrophage or a macrophage that has just ingested some harmful agent that can be microorganism or foreign particle then the macrophage liberated cytokines mainly tumor necrosis factor and interleukin 1 those liberated cytokines those locally produced cytokines if i want to be more specific acted on the endothelial cell and now there is expression of selectin molecule on the surface of endothelial cell and you can also see that leukocyte has glycoprotein salyl lewis modified glycoprotein to bind with these selectin molecules but initially this bond will be a weak bond in another word this bond uh, will be transient so the leukocyte will bind with the selectin molecule transiently or loosely and then it will detach and then bind again so in a sense the leukocyte will appear tumbling along the endothelium the next phase following rolling is the phase of adhesion always remember adhesion is mediated by integrins so what are these integrins integrins are transmembrane heterodimeric glycoproteins and they are expressed on the surface of leukocyte and there will be ligands corresponding to these different varieties of integrins and those ligands will be expressed on the endothelial surface so now i am showing you another table and here we have summarized the integrins and their ligands that are involved in the phase of adhesion so on the right column you can see different types of integrins that are expressed on the surface of the leukocyte and they will include beta 1 integrin say for example vla4 and also there will be beta 2 integrins like lfa1 and mac1 and on the left column you can see their corresponding ligands that are expressed on the endothelial cell surface so what is icam icam stands for intercellular adhesion molecule 1 and vcam stands for vascular cellular adhesion molecule 1 so now we will go deeper and discuss the mechanism of adhesion briefly now always remember these integrins that we just mentioned normally they are expressed on the leukocyte surface in a low affinity state so integrins do express themselves on the leukocyte surface normally but those integrins are in their low affinity state and what will happen during inflammation during inflammation um, as a consequence of injury and infection chemokines will be produced at the site of injury and later those chemokines will enter the blood vessel then they will bind with the endothelial cell proteoglycans this is very high yet you have to know this that chemokines will be produced at the site of injury then they will enter the blood vessel and bind with the proteoglycans on the surface of endothelial cell and then the chemokines will be expressed with the help of those proteoglycans on the surface of those endothelial cells why because we had just mentioned that uh, leukocytes are now rolling due to their different um, adhesive molecules that are responsible for rolling so the chemokines will try to act on those rolling leukocytes 
and once those rolling leukocytes are activated by these chemokines that are expressed on the proteoglycans on the surface of endothelial cells, what will be the consequence? The low affinity state integrins will be converted into high affinity state and that will result in firm adhesion between the leukocyte and the endothelial cells. As a result, the leukocytes will stop rolling and there will be reorganization in their cytoskeleton and the leukocytes will begin to spread out on the endothelial surface. The next phase following adhesion is the phase of transmigration or diapedesis. Now what happens during this step? The leukocytes will migrate through the endothelium. And always remember that uh, transmigration mainly occurs in the postcapillary venules. Chemokines will again have role in transmigration. They will stimulate the leukocytes and uh, they will stimulate them to migrate through the gaps between the endothelium, that is the interendothelial spaces. In order to do that, a lot of adhesion molecules will also play a role that are located in the intercellular junction between the endothelial cells. The most notable among them is the platelet endothelial cell adhesion molecule or PCAM1 or CD31. So with the help of these adhesion molecules, the leukocyte will begin to migrate through the endothelium. So what will the leukocyte do next? It has just migrated through the gap between two endothelial cells, but it still has to pierce the basement membrane to get out of the blood vessel, right? And how will the leukocyte do that? They will pierce the basement membrane of the blood vessels by secreting an enzyme called collagenase that will degrade those basement membrane in those areas. But also you have to remember after the leukocyte has migrated, those basement membrane will again become repaired. So there won't be any permanent damage in the basement membrane as a result of the collagenase secreted um, by the leukocyte. So what will the leukocytes do now? once they are out of the blood vessel. They will begin to migrate towards the site of injury as a result of chemical gradient and this process is known as chemotaxis and we will talk more about chemotaxis shortly afterwards but one thing you have to remember how will the leukocytes stay at the site of infection and at the site of injury once they have reached that final destination by chemotaxis. This is very important to know that once the leukocytes have reached their final destination by virtue of chemotaxis, they will remain in that location by the help of integrins and also CD44 that will bind the leukocyte with extracellular matrix proteins of those locations. So, the leukocytes will have to stay in those positions in order to perform their action, in order to remove the damaged necrotic cell debris and also to destroy the harmful microorganism. And they will do that by the help of integrin and CD44 that will bind the leukocyte with the extracellular matrix protein. So now we will talk about chemotaxis. So what do we mean by chemotaxis? It is defined as locomotion oriented along a chemical gradient. Okay, so I'm repeating the definition again for my students. Chemotaxis is defined as locomotion oriented along a chemical gradient. Now, whenever we define chemotaxis, the examiner may ask you about chemoattractants, the molecules that are responsible for the process of chemotaxis, and there are of two types. Some are exogenous, say for example bacterial products, and also some are endogenous chemoattractants. And among the endogenous chemoattractants, there is different types of 
cytokines and one family of chemokine is very important for your exam and that is interleukin 8. So that is the major cytokine involved in the process of chemotaxis and therefore it's called chemokine as well. So that is interleukin 8, that is a cytokine of the chemokine family. Other endogenous chemoattractants include complement component, particularly complement 5A, and uh, also arachidonic acid metabolites, mainly leukotriene B4, that is another major endogenous chemoattractant. Now, how do chemotaxis occur? What is the mechanism of chemotaxis? So, in order to understand the mechanism of chemotaxis, first you have to know about a receptor with which different chemoattractants will bind. So, chemoattractants or chemotactic agents begin the process of chemotaxis by binding with a 7 transmembrane G protein coupled receptor that is located on the surface of leukocyte. So when the chemoattractants bind with this 7 transmembrane G protein coupled receptor, what will happen next? Some signals will be induced. So there will be some signal induction that will result in activation of second messenger and increase of calcium in the cytosol of the leukocyte. And there will be also activation of some enzymes, particularly important is GTPase enzyme and also some kinase enzymes. So as a result of all these um, different activation, two important things will happen. Actin filaments will polymerize at the leading edge of the cell and myosin filaments will localize at the back. So always remember that following activation by those different chemoattractant, actin filaments will polymerize at the leading edge of the leukocyte and myosin filaments will localize at the back. And as a result, there will be formation of some phylopodia and uh, that will pull back the cell um, in the direction of extension. So that will pull the cell towards the direction of the leading edge. And in your textbook you will also see a very um, good um, example to explain this thing and in your textbook you will see an example of a front wheel driven automobile that means the engine uh, is in the front and similarly when we are talking about the chemotaxis the main uh, force the main driving force is in the leading edge and that is the polymerized actin and uh, as a result the cells will try to move in those directions and always remember that on the back side there will be localization of myosin filament. So here I'm also showing you a very simplified diagram to explain the leading edge and also the uh, myosin filament localization at the back. So the next step after chemotaxis is phagocytosis and uh, since I have a separate video entirely on phagocytosis so I will talk very briefly here and I will also recommend you to view that video on phagocytosis after watching this video to get more information. To say in short what do we mean by phagocytosis? In simple term it is also called cell eating that means it is the process by which a cell can ingest or engulf something and usually something that is solid because there is another process called pinocytosis by which a cell can ingest fluid or liquid material. So, regarding phagocytosis, it involves three sequential steps and they happen one after another. So, the first step is recognition and attachment. Now, think of the phagocyte as hitman, you know. Have you seen different movies where there are hitmen, you know, people who are hired to kill someone? So what do they do? 
during their job. First, they have to know their target. So similarly, phagocyte, which is also the hitman here, also, although phagocytes are good cells, not the bad guys here, right? So phagocyte first know about its target, and it does that by recognition and attachment with the particle that it wants to ingest. What will it do later? The second step. So the first step of phagocytosis was recognition and attachment. The next step is engulfment and uh, by this process the particles will be ingested by phagocyte and then it will form a phagocytic vacuole inside those cells. And the third step is killing and degradation of the ingested material. And there are different mechanisms by which the phagocytes can achieve this thing. And we will talk more about those things uh, in the video uh, link that I have mentioned in the description below. So now that we have briefly discussed the major cellular events of inflammation, now we will move on to the next topic and discuss about chemical mediators. So our next topic is introduction to chemical mediators. Here we will try to briefly talk about different chemical mediators. Now in some of your textbooks you will see that the chemical mediators of inflammation are also sometimes called permeability factor. So first we will try to discuss briefly the common properties of different chemical mediators. They share some common properties and as we will see they have different functions that are not common with one another. So first, let's talk about their shared properties or their common properties and then we will see how they differ from each other and how they function and play a role in inflammation. So the first common property is the mediators are either cell-derived or plasma protein-derived. So the cell-derived mediators can be stored or sequestered inside the intracellular granules and they can be rapidly secreted from those granules when needed by a process called granule exocytosis. Say for example in your textbook you will see that histamine is sequestered inside the granules of mast cell and when there is mast cell degranulation, histamine can be secreted. So that is one example of cell-derived mediator that was histamine and that normally is stored inside the granules. But one thing you have to remember, not all cell-derived mediators will be found sequestered inside different intracellular granules. Some will be produced when needed and those are called synthesized de novo cell-derived mediators. Examples are prostaglandins and cytokines. Now the major cells that will produce the cell-derived mediators will include macrophage, mast cell, platelets, neutrophils, and also mesenchymal cells, say for example the smooth muscle cell, fibroblast, endothelium, they can also produce cell-derived mediator. Regarding the plasma-derived mediator, one thing you have to remember, although we will find these mediators in the plasma, but as a matter of fact they are produced mainly in the liver. And when they enter into the circulation from liver, they enter in an inactivate form. And those inactivated or inactive plasma-derived mediators will only become activated when required. And the way they become activated is by using proteolytic cleavage. The next common property of inflammatory mediator is that they can be activated by different types of stimuli. The different stimuli 
will include microbial products, substances that are released from a dying or necrotic cell, and proteins of the complement system, coagulation system, kinin system, etc. The third common property of chemical mediator is that one chemical mediator can stimulate the release of other chemical mediator. And in your textbook, you will see different examples of that. Say, for example, we have seen that tumor necrosis factor, that is a chemical mediator, and that can stimulate production of cytokine, interleukin-1, chemokine from endothelial cell. So here, tumor necrosis factor was the primary mediator and that acted on endothelial cell and then endothelial cell became stimulated to produce interleukin-1 and other cytokines and in this case interleukin-1 and other cytokines will be considered secondary mediators. The next common property of chemical mediator is that they differ in their cellular target and also in their range. For example, many chemical mediators will act on only one type of cell, whereas other chemical mediators have more than one type of cell as their target. Again, we will see that some chemical mediators will have diverse target, whereas some chemical mediators will have different types of effect while acting on different types of cell. The next common property of inflammatory mediator is that they have a very short lifespan. And the reason is very obvious. We don't want them around all the time because that will uh, result in continuation of the inflammation. And we all know that inflammation has not only protective response, or protective effect but also if severely activated inflammation can also damage the host tissue so we don't want inflammation to do that we just want inflammation to be a protective response and in order to do that there has to be a balance and uh, that balance is achieved by reducing the lifespan of chemical mediators and how is that thing done there are four ways the chemical mediators uh, are removed. One is they get decayed quickly. Say, for example, the arachidonic acid metabolites decay quickly. Another mechanism is they can become inhibited. Say, for example, I'm sure you have heard about the complement components. They are also chemical mediators and they can be inactivated by a protein that is called complement regulatory protein. As a matter of fact, this protein degrades the activated complement component. So that is another mechanism of removing the chemical mediators. Another mechanism is by inactivating the chemical mediators by enzymes. Say for example, kinase is an enzyme and that can inactivate bradykinin. And the last mechanism by which chemical mediators can be removed is by different scavenging systems. Say, for example, there are antioxidants in our body and they can scavenge a lot of chemical mediators after they have been used. So now I will show you two tables that will summarize the sources and functions of major chemical mediators of inflammation. Now, my students don't like tables. They tend to run away when I try to show them different tables. I even have to show them teddy bears to keep them calm. So look, I'm also showing you teddy bear to keep you calm. And don't get scared of these two tables because these are very high yield information. The examiner will ask you a lot of questions from these two tables and for the beginners or those students who are learning about the chemical mediators of inflammation for the first time i will recommend you to listen to this video and then 
after you have listened to the video you can also read about these mediators in your textbook and then come back in this section of the video pause the video and uh, try to memorize the different mediators slowly because you will need them so i will now just describe the major points from these two tables so the first table will describe the principal source and function of cell derived chemical mediators so what are the common cell derived chemical mediators on the left column you can see their names they are histamine serotonin leukotrienes prostaglandins platelet activating factor reactive oxygen species nitric oxide and some cytokines and chemokines so i will skip the source because otherwise the table will look very busy so i will focus on the function and notice that histamine and serotonin has almost similar function both will cause vasodilation and increase the permeability of blood vessel the histamine in addition has one extra job to do and that is endothelial activation moving on to the prostaglandin and leukotriene you can see that they have common source both arise from leukocytes and mast cell however their function is not the same leukotriene the function of leukotriene is obviously it will have something to do with leukocyte because that's how it got its name so the functions of leukotriene will include leukocyte adhesion leukocyte activation it will also help in chemotaxis and increase vascular permeability and you can also see that prostaglandins function will be vasodilation and it will also have role in pain sensation and also in fever the next cell derived mediator is platelet activating factor it has a lot of function and the functions will include vasodilation increased vascular permeability chemotaxis leukocyte adhesion etc now i think you will know the function of reactive oxygen species very well because uh, i have a video about phagocytosis and there we had talked a lot about the reactive oxygen species so their function is to kill microorganism and nitric oxide also has similar function but the major function of nitric oxide is relaxation of a smooth muscle moving on to the cytokines first we will see that um, there is tumor necrosis factor and interleukin 1 and these cytokines will have a role in endothelial activation recall that we had discussed about endothelial cell and expression of adhesion molecules on the surface of endothelial cell and tnf tumor necrosis factor and interleukin 1 had a role in those mechanisms these cytokines will also have another function and that is they will decrease the vascular resistance and that can also result in shock moving on to the next cell derived chemical mediator in the table and that was chemokines and the name almost says it all chemokines will have role in chemotaxis and they will also have one additional function and that is leukocyte activation so now we will move on to the second table and here we will see the major source and function of plasma protein derived mediators so what were the plasma protein derived mediators they included complement products proteins of the kinin and coagulation system so let's see their function briefly one by one so in the complement product we have complement 5a complement 4a and complement 3a and their function will be chemotaxis leukocyte activation and vasodilation 
The function of kinins will include vasodilation, increased vascular permeability, smooth muscle contraction, and pain. And the function of the proteins of coagulation system, particularly proteases that are activated during coagulation, will be endothelial activation and leukocyte recruitment. So this concludes today's video about inflammation part 2. This is a very long topic and I will also try to upload the third part of this series, hopefully within a week, where we will talk about chronic inflammation. And I will also recommend my students to go through your textbooks to know more information. And for my viewers, if you like my videos, do subscribe, share, comment and let me know. Okay, so that's all for today. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.